so first of all, a couple uh, quick uh, survey questions here. Um, how many people have seen uh, this error message? Invalid, uh, OK. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's usually the start of a bad day. OK, so uh, who has seen that in a production system? I'm, I'm guessing that's the same set of hands, because you almost never see this in testing, only in production. <laughs> um, and then uh, for, uh, for which of you did that lead to uh, permanent data loss? Anyone? OK, a couple. Um, and then uh, did you have a backup or a replica? OK, you had a backup or a replica. Uh, and did that still lead to uh, permanent, permanent data loss in that case? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So it's, it's kind of, you knew exactly when it happened, which was good. You don't always get that. So. Okay, good. So that, that was fortunate. So uh, no, uh, no permanent data loss for the people with the, the backups or replicas uh, yet. So um, one thing uh, that I'll be uh, kind of talking about through this talk is sometimes uh, you'll end up in a situation where the, the same block uh, ends up bad on the primary and, and you think you have a backup. but in reality, that same block might be bad. So uh, the, the first uh, you know, question we need to, to answer is, uh, who should we blame? Right? This is the, you know, the first thing we you know, think there's some kind of corruption. And so there's a lot of different pieces involved. And so we'd like to you know, kind of figure out what the responsibility of each component is, what's failing, which components should be checking the other components. Um, so, you know, the first reaction, of course, is to blame uh, the hardware or the, the RAID controller or storage system or the firmware on one of those devices. Um, and that, that is a, you know, totally reasonable, valid uh, place to start. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't get you very far because you don't have a whole lot of control. Um, so uh, we're not going to be talking about uh, what you can do there uh, so much. Um, most of you have a pretty good idea of which options are more reliable than others, others in that respect. Um, but I, I think that it's important to always check at a higher level anyway. Uh, even if you think your, your system is reliable, I'll kind of go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, what we will be talking about um, is PostgreSQL and what it has to offer, and then uh, how you you uh, construct your uh, replication and backup strategies uh, to deal with this problem. Uh, the, the real answer, of course, is all of the above could be blamed, but you know, this is what we'll focus on. So uh, I kind of left out file systems. Uh, let me go into a digression about that uh, quickly. Um, so uh, one of the things about file systems, is it's, it seems like a natural place to do that corruption uh, checking to, to make sure that everything's OK before it makes it into, say, Postgres or some other application or the, the backup program you're using to backup Postgres. So if that's the case, um, uh, the, the problem with file systems, this, this uh, talk, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the abstract, is targeted at people who you know, are not necessarily able to use some uh, very sophisticated SAN or other system that, that does all this checking for you. Um, and you know, the file system is available on an on a ordinary uh, local storage Linux box or something like that. You could uh, look into ZFS and ButterFS. Those offer checksums, and they'll do validation, those checksums. And that could kind of be a, a reasonable choice. But the problem is that neither of these really are reasonable choices for uh, many people, um, you know, it, it, doing the file system makes sense, but which file system do you choose? Um, the only real options are Butter, ButterFS and ZFS. Um, you know, both are either experimental or not widely deployed. Uh, you know, uh, let me do a quick survey. You know, how many people have evaluated uh, ButterFS or ZFS? Okay, I, I only see a couple of hands there, and then so I'm assuming, uh, do you, uh, how many of, of you use uh, that in production for a database? Um, okay, so I see, I see no hands, so 
perhaps uh, people either read the abstract of the talk and realized uh, that this was targeted um, uh, mostly people who who couldn't uh, use that option, or it's just uh, not viable for, for many people to use those file systems. Uh, I'll briefly go into why. Um, both are copy on write style, um, and there's, there's actually a technical reason. It gets a little bit uh, complicated. We can discuss it more at the end of the talk if there's time, but there are some technical reasons why copy on write and checksums go together. If you're not doing something that's <coughs> resembling copy on write, uh, in the file system or the storage layer, uh, then uh, it is difficult to get those checksums uh, right without introducing performance or uh, performance problems or uh, false negatives. Um, and then it also turns out that these copy on write file systems are not particularly good for database applications uh, for many workloads. Uh, there are some people, um, I, you know, I know of some people who do uh, actually prefer, say, ZFS for uh, their uh, database workload, but it does have some significant disadvantages for many workloads. Uh, these copy on write semantics uh, lead to fragmentation of the files, so what you think is a sequential read is actually uh, much more random. So. Um, just based on that, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, unlikely that these file systems are ready now, and it, it's also, uh, even if you wait for stabilization and optimization of these file systems, they may never be what you want for your database workload. So it's, it's not, not a great solution. So that, that's kind of to, uh, to set file systems aside for the rest of the talk. Um, if, does anyone have any questions about file systems? I uh, just want to mention that another, another downside to relying on the file system to do this corruption detection is that I don't know of any file system that does that detection in memory cache. So if you end up with an error that gets introduced to the memory to the file system cache, you'll never know it. Uh, yeah, the, the point uh, was uh, that uh, the file systems also don't check the in-memory uh, cache, and uh, so that leaves an additional vulnerability. Often that memory cache is very large, so um, there is a, a greater chance of some error happening there. Uh, if you have uh, rampant uh, memory problems, that will likely result in crashes and corruption regardless. But if you have very rare memory problems, then, then that could be a problem that it, that it might not be otherwise. Uh, with using uh, file systems to detect the checksums, to detect the uh, corruption, sorry. So uh, as far as the, the goals here um, of what we want to accomplish is we want to detect and contain the corruption. Uh, by that I mean, uh, uh, did I, I think I skipped a slide here, um, sorry, okay. So we'd like to uh, reliably detect corruption as early as we can, and we'd like to avoid propagating this corruption uh, once we've found it. So if you don't know that there's uh, corruption there, it will likely propagate. Uh, and then uh, we want to eventually have a recovery plan based on this uh, information. So um, all of these are related. If you have uh, corruption and it goes undetected, it's almost certainly going to make it to the the replica or the backup, in which case now the corruption is everywhere and y you know you could go a long time potentially removing old backups and then uh, you know you'd be uh, totally unable to recover at all. Um, so uh, first uh, we can talk about detection. So right now the, this is what is available uh, in Postgres to help with the detection problem. This is the, the baseline. When I talk about detection, uh, what I'm uh, really talking about is the mechanism. Uh, so I kind of separate it into you know, detection and then containment, but it, they're a little bit related. Uh, when I say detection, I mean the underlying mechanism that you use to determine whether uh, corruption has happened, assuming you're already looking at the data. Um, so uh, you know, here in uh, Postgres, you can use uh, it, the existing 
Postgres, it will always do this page header check. So the error we saw at the beginning of the presentation, um, up here, uh, this error uh, is the result of that page header check. It's a very simple sanity check. So it's um, missing a lot of errors. And a lot of errors actually won't result in that. They'll end up turning into crashes or uh, undetected corruption. So the page header check is available, but it's, it's somewhat weak. You could uh, make use of that uh, and look out for that. You certainly want to look for that in log files and so forth. It will not take the system down. Uh, so you might actually not notice even if your application is getting errors. If uh, the application gets errors rarely and those errors aren't, aren't seen by uh, somebody in the uh, operations team, then uh, you, you might actually not notice even if Postgres is, is noticing. So it's, it's still useful to be aware of that error and at least uh, be on the lookout for it with uh, monitoring tools. Um, in 9.3, which will be released uh, later this year, um, this has a, a much more robust way of detecting errors that should form a, a better base on which we can, uh, w which we can use to contain those errors uh, and then hopefully be able to recover from them. So the checksums in 9.3, I'll, I'll talk about uh, a little bit more in the next slide. And then uh, after that, uh, PG file dump. So um, checksums in 9.3 are, are a big improvement over the page header check. It's essentially a, a much better version of the page header check. If you uh, have some kind of corruption, it's very likely to, dete to detect it. It will uh, detect um, even if a page is good, but if the file system jumbled the blocks and moved that good block to another location, uh, it will detect that because it incorporates the page number into that checksum calculation. Um, so uh, that, that actually, uh, although it sounds like a theoretical problem where the IO system is mixing up blocks like that, um, I, I can assure you that is not a theoretical problem. That is a very practical problem um, with uh, some you know, uh, buggy firmware, that kind of thing. So, uh, so that is, that's certainly a problem. So it should detect things like that. It will, of course, detect corruption in the middle of a page. And then it's just much more reliable uh, way to detect that the data you've written is not the same data that your storage system gave back. Uh, PG file dump. Um, how many have uh, heard of this utility here? Anyone? Okay, just a few people. So I, I highly recommend you look at it. It's it's not um, it's not perfect uh, for what we want to use it for, but it's it's uh, really the only tool out there like this right now. Um, I hope uh, to change that uh, sometime. Uh, in upcoming Postgres releases and so forth. But this is uh, on PG Foundry. It's a tool. And uh, it will examine. It'll do a little bit more exhaustive checking than just the page header check. And then you can also do it offline on the files. And it, it gives you information about the contents of those files. Um, and then if it has some problem interpreting uh, the data pages um, which or the index pages, then it will. Uh, write an error to, um, it, it'll have an error in the output and you can uh, just grep for that. Um, so that's, you know, that might be a typical uh, way if you suspect corruption. You could uh, use PG file dump on uh, one file or every file in the database and then uh, grep for the errors. If you see those errors, you've got corruption. Uh, I mean, assuming the system's you know offline, and everything you you wouldn't use this for an online system. Um, but if if you already suspect corruption, this is a, a great tool. This is you know going to be one of the only resources you have, aside from uh, essentially a hex editor. So uh, it's it's good to be aware of that. I actually recommend that you install uh, this on you know the the systems where you know that you're concerned about to have it ready. Um, you know, I don't think that this is packaged on most of the distributions out there, OS distributions. So, 
um, might be good to you know compile it ahead of time so that when you know problem strikes, you already are a little bit familiar with it. Uh, yeah. yeah, so the question was about uh, what would be a use case for this, which that is uh, one use case um, is trying to verify a backup that's taken, you know, an offline backup. So that, that is one potential use case. Um, there are uh, some limits to how, how useful it is for that, but um, I mean, certainly uh, you want it to, you know, be able to uh, confirm or or deny whether there's any corruption that happened. So um, if the system's online or if it hasn't, you know, uh, if it's an inconsistent, you know, base backup that hasn't been brought to a consistent state yet, then, um, you know, there's always a chance that it could give, you know, false positives. But ev even that should be relatively rare. So if you just use it as a manual process to quickly determine whether you have corruption or not. Uh, it can be very useful. Um, okay, so the, the follow-up question was about prevention versus, uh, you know, uh, after the fact uh, diagnosis. So, um, you know, it depends on what level you're talking about the prevention at. This won't prevent corruption, but because it detects it, it can help us avoid spreading it and propagating it to other places. So it can help us contain those, that corruption, and that alone could you know, uh, mean the difference between a recover, recoverable system and a, a not recoverable system. So uh, a, another question here? Uh, a valid check for the master? Right. Oh, okay. I, I see what you're saying. So that's that's an interesting question. I'm going to go a little bit more into that. I think in one of the other slides about the the role replication plays here. Um, so let me get to that, and then we'll come back to your question if it's if it's not answered. So uh, again, just to uh, quickly repeat, um, I recommend uh, just familiarizing yourself with this tool, at least downloading it, compiling it. That way, when you uh, run into a problem, it's, it's uh, close at hand. Um, so when I talk about containment, uh, you know, what I mean is when you see the data, you, you want to actively look at the data uh, before you're relying on that data being correct. Um, so. Uh, there's a couple levels of that. You know, one is that uh, if you're just running queries, right? So you, you don't want to get wrong results, and you don't want Postgres to crash. Uh, so that's um, what the the page header check will do, and it's also uh, something that the the checksums feature will uh, that's coming 9.3 will do a very good job at preventing that kind of propagation. So the the checksums will contain. Uh, that corruption, keep it out of the Postgres executor so that it doesn't cause mysterious crashes and, uh, you know, keep it out of the executor so it doesn't cause wrong results if, if they happen to uh, be a more subtle kind of corruption. Um, the, uh, the other kind of containment is, you know, whether it makes it to backups and replicas. So uh, that, that's really, uh, you know, the worst situation is that you have one instance of corruption, you believe that you're protected because you have a series of backups or replicas, and everything seems fine, and then by the time you detect the corruption, if it's already spread, uh, that's, that's kind of the worst case because you're almost certainly looking at data loss at that point. So uh, that's, uh, that's what I mean when I say contain the corruption. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things is um, I, th I think that uh, many Postgres uh, deployments are actually quite vulnerable to corruption because a base backup really makes no, no attempt to check uh, for corruption. You're really relying on the disk and the file system to give you back the right information. And if it doesn't, 
if there is some kind of corruption there, it's just going to copy it into the backup or into, into the replica. When you take a base backup to make a replica, it'll, it's just going to copy it over. So um, that's, uh, you know, that's not a good situation. Um, you know, I hope that that will be better in the future. Um, but you know, in the in the meantime, we have to do what we can to you know, for instance, using PG file dump to uh, you know avoid um, copying the you know avoid relying on a backup until we've done some verification of it. Um, so you know, this is this is a a big deal, right? Is that the backups don't really protect you against against these kinds of corruption problems. So yeah, you really want to validate your backups, and you know, PG file dump is is uh, really the only tool out there that can help you do that right now. Um, it's not quite so bad as that. There, act Postgres actually does have a mechanism that really, really mitigates this problem, and that's streaming replication. So the nice thing about streaming replication, I think this goes back to your question here, is that. Uh, Streaming or replication is based on these write-ahead log records called uh, wall records. And so those uh, are transmitted to the uh, secondary and replayed there. And each one of those records has a checksum on it itself, a CRC. And so if you have corruption on the master, that's going to be uh, most likely in the data area where it was actually stored on disk. Um, and if the wall does happen to become corrupted, this standby will notice immediately, and you'll, you'll detect it instantly, and you'll know that there's a problem right away. If it's the data area on the primary that's corrupted, uh, that most likely won't make it to the secondary at all, because the, the method of replication is through the streaming channel only. And if that's the case, then uh, you're not actually moving files from one file system to another, and you're not relying on this uh, unreliable uh, file system. So um, streaming replication mitigates this, this problem quite a lot. Um, there are still things you need to be careful of. Uh, if you resync the streaming replica at some point, then you're relying on a base backup in order to, to resync the replica. Um, so, uh, how many people uh, use streaming replication here? Okay, so uh, a lot of people, and so that that's uh, I think a good mechanism. I think that it's not perfect, but it it mitigates the problem because uh, you're not doing as many of these base backups, and so it makes it easier to verify the ones you do, um, and it makes it uh, more likely that you'll notice the corruption before you've done a base backup and copied it to the, to the replica. So you want to be um, still careful of those resync um, operations that uh, you know, involve a new base backup. Um, but if you just keep a continuous streaming replication uh, system going, uh, then you're, you're much less likely to run into a problem. Um, it, yeah, you can end up, if you modify the same page, uh, so uh, let me repeat the question. So uh, if um, the, the question was about full page writes, which are a way that data pages on the primary make it into uh, the write ahead log and then are transmitted across uh, to potentially the streaming replica. And that is a valid point, uh, but ordinarily what happens there is that the, it, the master at least needs to read it there. So let's say you're using checksums on the primary. Uh, I know that's not available until 9.3, but if, you, if you'll uh, go with this for just a minute, that would involve uh, you know, a modification to a page on the primary, which would involve a read of that page which would involve a verification of the checksum. And then so you actually have a good page there, and then it makes it into the right ahead log, and then it makes it a secondary. So you're actually good in that case. And so it's not a big problem. It is, if you're not using checksums, it is a potential problem because the page header check isn't good enough. 
and it may uh, have, you know, falsely say that the page is okay. And if it doesn't end up causing a back end crash or something else, if the corruption is subtle enough to make it through and continue processing and then make it into the wall, it could make it to the secondary. So uh, that is still a uh, vulnerability uh, to it, but uh, in 9.3 with checksums, that uh, vulner vulnerability will, uh, for the most part, be closed up. Uh, oh, yeah, right. The, uh, the other comment, and I think this is a good point, is that streaming replication is not the only way you can avoid problems like this. Um, so uh, he was pointing out that LoanDist, uh, is, which is another replication system uh, based on PGQ, it's, it's uh, available. It's a part of uh, SkyTools, if I remember correctly. And uh, so that's um, available at, uh, it's a, a Skype. Uh, product. Um, it, I mean, it's uh, open source and everything, but it, if you're looking for it, I don't happen to have the URL handy, but it's uh, Sky Tools, um, which is uh, done by Skype. And uh, so that is a uh, logical replication mechanism. And because of that, it's unlikely, since you're not copying data pages around, then it's, uh, it's unlikely for the corruption to make it to the replica for that reason. Um, so that, I think that's a good point. Uh, I think uh, in many cases, uh, streaming replication, even without checksums, is quite good protection. But um, that might be a little bit better than, the, than what's currently uh, available without checksums. Um, in 9.3, I believe that uh, it will be at least as uh, uh, solid to use streaming replication as, as Lundist for that purpose. Question? Okay, yeah, so the question is uh, performance penalty on the checksum. So uh, it's relatively low in many cases. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, we did do, you know, some significant performance uh, testing. Um, the main cost, the, the checksum algorithm itself is quite fast. Um, somebody uh, named Ant Asma, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, but he did uh, quite a bit of uh, research into the checksum algorithm and he chose one that's uh, vectorizable and so forth on uh, modern processors and you know, overall it should be uh, a very quick to calculate checksum algorithm. Uh, so that ordinarily would not be the problem. That might have a, a slight overhead in, in workloads where you have uh, small shared buffers, uh, but large RAM, and then you're exchanging a lot, you know, kind of between the file system and Postgres. Um, so uh, that could have an overhead there, not a huge overhead, but it'll have some, you know, something noticeable. Um, and then, uh, uh, not to go into too much detail, but um, the, uh, the other cost you'll see is you could see additional full page writes being uh, sent to the wall. So that could, um, that's actually the most likely performance problem you'll see is, is an increase in the full page writes being sent to the write ahead log. Another question? Yeah, just sort of a follow up. It's like, what if you're coupling it with something like ButterFS or ZFS that also does a checksum and you're using checksums for, for a lot of that data? Is IO still the bottleneck versus all those checksum numbers run all the time? Um, okay, so the question is, uh, does the overhead kind of compound if you're using uh, these, this checksum algorithm over, say, ButterFS or ZFS, which does its own checksums? Um, I, I haven't done any specific analysis on that, but yes, the, it would compound if both systems are, are checking uh, the same data, then uh, it compounds. And what I would do is I just look at your risk tolerance and say, well, is one checksum at one layer good enough for me? And then. Um, 
Right. Yeah, being one level higher up uh, is often, you know, often useful. Uh, so um, I think that if you were to choose one, you'd probably go with the Postgres checksums. But it also kind of depends on whether you're getting something out of ZFS or ButterFS already. So if, if you're choosing to use that file system because it works for you, then great. And maybe those checksums are good enough, and, and that would be a very reasonable option. Um, but when you uh, don't like the performance of ButterFS or ZFS, and you know if you're switching to them because of the checksums, then actually might be better just sticking with Postgres and using checksums there. Um, right, uh, that was a, a good point uh, Hickey just uh, brought up. Uh, so that was uh, that, you know, it does offer you potentially more protection to have uh, both checksums because uh, for one thing if there's, you know, some subtle problem, if you see say one checksum fail and the other not, then uh, that could be a red flag that would require more investigation. And additionally, um, the not every bit of data related to Postgres is currently checksummed. So uh, I you know, would like that to change, or, or uh, I would like that to substantially all be covered um, eventually. But uh, in the 9.3 implementation, it covers the data area only. So it leaves out some structures that Postgres uses which are still very important, but um, you know, uh, you know, are not are not part of the 9.3 implementation, so would still be vulnerable. Um, oh, another uh, thing I just uh, thought I, I would uh, mention is that, you know, you could also have a case, you know, with streaming replication, another thing to be careful of is although it does offer lots of protection, it, uh, you know, it also, if it's going on for a long time and you have a huge amount of data, then you could have totally independent failures in both. And so you, you really do want to be kind of checking both systems because, uh, you know, it doesn't do any good to kind of leave a, a backup uh, you know, around for a long time with the data uh, maybe potentially getting corrupted there uh, going unnoticed because uh, then, you know, when you get this other random failure on the primary, then you go to the secondary and the, the data is not there either. Or the, maybe it's, you know, different corruption somewhere else. Um, so, uh, you know, you have to watch out for those, those independent failures also. Um, so as far as recovery goes, uh, you either, you know, go to failover to replica or you restore from backup. Um, I think you're all aware of those options. There's not a whole lot more to say. Um, you know, essentially if you have avoided propagating the corruption and you've been checking frequently enough and uh, detecting it early enough, then everything should be fine and, you know, the high level design of you know, having backups and, and replicas will give you the durability and the uh, uh, safety that, that uh, you would expect. Um, you know, if you are missing some piece um, and you're not detecting the errors early enough uh, or you uh, somehow end up propagating uh, bad data, then it's very likely to result in permanent data loss. And, um, <coughs> You know, the, the most you can do at that point is, uh, you know, use a little bit of creativity to, to try and uh, avoid, uh, you know, complete disaster. But there's no, uh, no real principled way uh, beyond that point where you've propagated uh, corruption. Um, so as, oh, hey, question. Streaming replica is too far behind to stream, and it goes back into a log, a log base um, replication. Is it still just as safe as it was streaming because checksumming is done on the individual log records, or is that no longer the case? 
So the question was that uh, with streaming replication, um, ordinarily it just goes, you know, kind of RAM to uh, straight over the network. Um, so uh, the question was about the case where it doesn't, where there's some replication lag and the wall data has actually made it to disk and then therefore to continue with the replication in the streaming replication it needs to go back, go to disk, get the wall records, then send those to the streaming replica. So that changes the failure mode a little bit. Um, what will happen is that the, the wall records are checksummed. They have been for a long time, uh, that even long before 9.3. Um, so uh, that will detect the error. Um, and replication will stop, and your monitoring tools will alert uh, whoever uh, it needs to, and uh, you should be able to, to take it from there. Um, and so it'll avoid replicating the corruption in that case. Um, okay, so should it also be the case then that, like, say, an 8.4 instance that's using log-based binary replication would be just as safe as what we're discussing with streaming records? Um, okay, so the, the, the follow-up question was whether, you know, uh, copying log files uh, for replication, in other words, kind of the old warm standby uh, kind of process, right, where you're archiving logs and using and replaying those logs continuously. I, is that the kind of system you were talking about? Yeah, is that because I, I assume that the, the wall record based check sum is, is still being done at the receiving end as well prior to version number two? Yeah, yes, that's right. So since the wall records are checksummed, uh, that they have a CRC on them, then you are protected as long as all you're doing is replaying the wall. Um, so the danger point is really at that base backup stage. Um, and the difference between getting uh, the wall from the file system versus getting it from just RAM as a streaming replica uh, set might is that um, if it's still in RAM, you're less likely to, to actually get an error because it won't have, um, you know, had a chance to read it from disk yet. So you know, just like uh, maybe that's as as part of a more general point, any hot data uh, is less likely to uh, uh, any corruption in any backing file of of some data that's hot in memory um, is less likely to be de detected because the data is still in memory and you're not actually doing the read from disk. So. Uh, that that's kind of the general statement there is just you know RAM versus disk there is that it would not be detected uh, if it's still in RAM and still good in RAM. Okay. Okay. So a uh, quick uh, summary of the the current state of of things. Um, you know I I recommend making streaming replication uh, a more important part of your replication strategy for the purpose of safety. Um, and avoiding uh, frequent uh, base backups with, uh, you know, without doing some kind of verification on those base backups. Um, and then uh, when, you know, 9.3 comes out, of course, I, I recommend that everyone uh, use checksums. Uh, if, you know, concerned about any performance issues, I highly re recommend that you start testing now. The beta's out. Um, and you can, you know, put a workload on that and see if you notice any difference at all. Um, if you notice anything, uh, you know, uh, more than kind of a, you know, uh, marginal change or, or some additional um, uh, additional full page writes going to the write ahead log, then of course report that to the list if it's if it's actually a performance problem. Um, so. Um, so yeah, that's that's the uh, the the current situation is uh, you know get familiar with PG file dump. Oh, uh, question. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Oh, okay.
Uh, right. I um, uh, PG, the, the, the question was about PG dump or the comment was about PG dump being also another way to verify. Uh, so a couple of comments about that is one that that only works on a running system. So that's that's more of an online check, which is still very you know very useful. So that could be a good way to test, say the the primary um, PG file dump is better for backup because you don't need to start the backup up. You just need to bring it to a consistent state, um, and uh, then um, also PG file dump. Uh, you know, will not crash your server, right? I mean, if you're concerned about corruption, I, I mean, maybe uh, you don't want to, maybe you don't want to crash the, the server, right? If, if, if it's uh, corrupt data and PG dump is trying to dump that out, um, you know, other things could happen, right? I mean, it might not result in a nice convenient error like we saw in the first slide of this talk. Um, so. That's just kind of a caution, but in general, yes, I, I agree. PG dump is a is a good way to do an online check. Oh, Jim. Um, yeah, another uh, similar method to PG dump that can actually be uh, liable to use a database-wide backend. Um, it's not exactly the same as PG dump, although one nice thing is the backend can also hit some of your index pages. So uh, a couple of points came up there, just uh, discussion in the audience there. I'll, uh, I'll repeat. Uh, so um, uh, Jim brought up the fact that vacuum could be an alternative online check uh, to instead of doing a PG dump. So uh, vacuum and PG dump, um, they both would be a, a fairly good way to do an online check, uh, but uh, at the same time, both are incomplete. Um, you know. Uh, as, as Jim pointed out, a PG dump will largely miss the indexes because it's doing sequential scans to just dump all the data out. And then uh, vacuum, um, if you have, uh, if it's skipping pages because of the visibility map, might uh, you know skip all of the pages and maybe the pages that are that are coldest and haven't been touched in a long time and maybe are therefore more prone to corruption. So both of them can miss things. Um, but they're certainly good sanity checks uh, for the system. Um, yeah, the, the comment was you can, you can make vacuum uh, look at all the data. I think, uh, I, I forget what that option is, is called too, but there's a, a guck. Um, it's, uh, um, yeah, well, anyway. Uh, so yeah, I think there's there's some way to get vacuum to, uh, you know, to to uh, go through all the data also. There's an Another question. Uh, yeah, I mean it's 
you know, any of these checks are going to be incomplete because if you have if you have one bit flip in a, a number somewhere, an account balance, the only thing that's going to catch that is a checksum. You know, so uh, all of these checks are a little bit incomplete. You know, it would be a, a fairly um, subtle kind of corruption to, to not be detected by a vacuum when vacuum looks at that page. Um, it would have to be a pretty, pretty small amount of corruption or a, a strange pattern. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's a reasonable online check, I think. I mean, it's, you know, like PG file dump, not perfect, but it, it gets, you know, many of the cases. Right. So is this fair to say that if, I, if there's corruption in the master, I will see it on the standby? Not the but a standby maybe I, I will have some more errors because it went for a long time and maybe it's headphones? Um, I, I, uh, having errors on the, s the primary versus the standby, I mean, there's, there's, not, there's going to be some connection there if you end up copying the, the corruption over. Otherwise, it's, uh, you know, you could have corruption on one and not the other very, very easily, right? I mean, you could imagine if, if you have cold data on both of them, then they could have independent corruption events in that cold data. So, so I'm, I'm just wondering if I can, because I can't really scan production because I can't shut it down. So if I scan standby, would I be able to find all the corruptions in, in the master if that was um, well, if you have streaming replication, you might miss some of the corruption that way because of the, the wall mechanism that I was describing, right? It, since it's not copying the data pages over, then that's actually an advantage, right? I mean, you, you know, so what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to, you're trying to replicate the corruption because you want to look for it, which is, uh, which is an interesting point. Um, and you could have you know, what I would recommend in that case is take a base backup of the master and then check that, or use an online check like doing a, a vacuum um, or a PG dump to, to uh, you know, verify that, that the data is, is largely intact. Um, let me uh, just uh, go into some of the improvements that I'm uh, looking forward to uh, introducing uh, in the future. This, uh, this wiki page here is, is where I've been uh, you know, working on some outlines and some ideas. Um, it's, you know, not always up to date, but, uh, you know, plan on uh, working on, you know, several things or at least, you know, kind of planning out uh, several features that will improve uh, the error detection capabilities in Postgres and the tools surrounding it to, to make uh, replication and backup safer. So um, a couple of the, the things uh, I have in mind. One is that right now, uh, Postgres considers all zero pages to be valid. Uh, and the reason for that is a little bit technical and has to do with relation extension. Um, but I'd like to try to find some solution for that because if a zero page is valid, then that means the kind of corruption that just zeroes out a bunch of data will always go undetected. Um, or go undetected if it aligns on a page. Um, so uh, that, that's one thing that I think uh, I'd like to find a solution for. Uh, another is that, as Hickey pointed out, uh, the C log and the uh, shared uh, LRU, um, or the simple LRU? Anyway, the yeah, shared LRU, um, uh, so that that mechanism is not currently checksum, so that can end up with, uh, you know, writing to disk, and then that could end up uh, getting corrupted. And the C log in particular is quite important. That's the commit log for Postgres. And so it's uh, you know, a relatively small amount of data, but it's, it's important that it's not corrupted. Uh, I focused on data pages first because there's so many more of them. But I think we need a solution for that as well. Uh, temporary files are not as critical, of course. But if you're doing a sort and an external sort spills to disk, and then um, you know you could end up with a situation, and I've I've seen this before, where um, you know a mysterious crash, um, 
it's, it was kind of hard to prove that this was actually corruption from the file system, but I, you know, in this case at least, I was almost certain that uh, it was some temporary file that was being written out due to an external sort, and then when it's read back in, the contents are wrong, and then Postgres crashes. Um, and these are mysterious and take quite a bit of time to investigate. Um, so that would be a potential you know, improvement to be able to detect that, which might um, you know, make it less likely to encounter a crash and uh, quicker to diagnose. Um, and additionally, it might offer, be kind of a canary in the coal mine if you see corruption there uh, if you have a workload that's heavy on hash joins or sorts or something that uses disk, then um, you know that might be kind of a, a canary in the coal mine that might alert you to to corruption before it hits other other aspects, other areas of your data. Um, and then uh, a few other things uh, I'd like uh, right now. Uh, Postgres has difficulty distinguishing between uh, corruption that happens somewhere in the wall, in the write-ahead log, um, and the end of the write-ahead log that it needs to replay. So in some cases, it can detect that difference. Um, for instance, with a base backup in certain areas, it can detect that it hasn't reached a consistent state yet. But in other uh, situations, it actually thinks uh, you know, uh, that when it encounters the corruption, that that's the end of the write-ahead log, and then it'll bring the system up, and that could result in inconsistent uh, database. So that, that's, uh, you know, potentially a, a quite a bad problem. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, when, let's say you have a Postgres, you know, Postgres is running fine and you have a power failure, um, then when writing that last wall record, maybe only a part of that wall record actually made it to disk. And then so when you bring the system up and try and replay, the first thing that's going to happen is, you know, the, the CRC check is going to fail. And so, you know, when that happens, it needs to be able to recover. And, and in that case, it's already actually reached the real end of the wall that's for any committed transactions. So that's okay. Uh, but the problem is then when you have real corruption, not just a power failure, then it could actually mistakenly think it found the end of the, the write-ahead log. So uh, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to f you know, find some solution there as well. Um, oh, and then also, of course, we you know, need a way to kind of enable and disable and control these checksums based on people's risk tolerances and so forth. And then uh, I'd like, uh, you know, a well-accepted uh, method for a base backup to fail if uh, corruption is encountered either while it's happening or in a, you know, uh, follow-up verification step. So this is, this is a big one. Um, we'd like, you know, some way to say that you don't have a good backup. Um, and so that could be done as part of a PG base backup. Uh, maybe that uses a verification step after the fact and then fails um, if that verification step fails. Uh, but that's, that's critical so that, that way you don't start removing your old backups or relying on that backup. Um, and then I'd like a more complete offline checker. This of course ties into the, the, the previous point um, to validate backups. And then uh, a background uh, checker that works online. So. Uh, something like vacuum or PG dump, but a little bit more principled, targeted really at just uh, reading and checking the checksums and otherwise discarding the data. Um, you might not want to run lots of PG dumps that acquire, you know, uh, you know, that try to get a consistent snapshot and, and all of these things and hold the snapshot open for a long period of time and so forth. Question? Uh, can you repeat that? Um, the 9.3 checksums feature uh, works on online systems, so it'll, um, when it's reading data from the disk into uh, Postgres uh, controlled memory, it will validate the checksum at that point. So if the backup, if you actually bring the backup up into, and restore it, 
um, then the checksums will come into play. Uh, but Um, when I uh, refer to backup, I'm generally talking about the, uh, the you know, online backup, um, the what's called a base backup. Um, so, uh, another question? Right, okay, so the, the question was about uh, PG upgrade and the, the checksums, uh, what to do with the checksums and whether it checks on the data before it enters the new system. So we need a way to enable and disable checksums. And so right now it's an, an, an DB time option. So you can't upgrade from, you can't do PG upgrade from having no checksums to having checksums. Um, so what we want to do is we want to provide a mechanism so that, and this, this is not available in 9.3, but if you upgrade from a you know, uh, previous system to a new system, then afterward you could then enable the checksums. Uh, yeah. Uh, for 9.3, that, yes, that's, that's correct. Um, because as you point out, there are potential problems. You don't want to just copy over unchecksumed files and then have them still have no checksums um, and then be, it's essentially not validated data, right? If you're trying to be safe, you want to start from a clean, uh, uncorrupted point anyway, uh, most likely. But uh, yeah, we, we would like to provide a mechanism for, you know, enabling and disabling checksums. Uh, I, So uh, quickly uh, to conclude, um, you know, this is the same, uh, same idea, uh, you know, use uh, file dump, uh, you know, uh, incorporate streaming replication, uh, test checksums now, use it in production when 9.3 comes out, and, uh, you know, just be careful on relying on unver unverified base backups. And uh, look out for some significant improvements, you know, post 9.3. Uh, well, starting in 9.3, really, with the, the checksums feature there. So uh, if, if there are any more questions, uh, I'll, if, yes? Um, ordinarily, it'll give the table name and the block number. So. Um, you know, usually it'll take some investigation to find out how extensive it is because you'll get one error, but often there will be many bad blocks. So, um, or, you know, if you're uh, comfortable with uh, the OIDs and mapping relations to files, um, you know, uh, then then you can make use of that. Um, uh, I, that's that's maybe another good recommendation is just for people to be familiar mapping relations to OIDs and, and back uh, and to actual files on the file system is a, you know, a good thing to be comfortable with before you encounter a real problem. Uh, like I said, it will, I think, tell you the table name in the error message, but at the same time, you know, you're almost always going to have follow-up investigation that will require more. So. Okay, thank you.